Now, we th when we think of the incarnation as this descent of the higher into the lower, that inevitably involves this idea of shrinking or narrowing down. When we say that God, the creator and infinite power behind all facts, the source of all being itself, the ground of being becomes human, then what we're saying is the infinite becomes particular. The limitless limits itself and narrows itself down. So God then comes to a, a galaxy and into that galaxy comes to a third rate arm of the galaxy, to a third rate sun and solar system, to the third planet of that sun and then becomes a particular species in that planet. And then in order to become a human must what? choose a particular group of humans to be born among a particular nation and then a particular family among the groups and citizens of that nation and then to be that one particular person and so this descent necessarily involves another characteristic which in our day and age we find the most repugnant and that's the idea of the incarnation being very selective. It involves the whole notion of a chosen person out of a chosen family, out of a chosen people. And when you think of chosenness, what do you think of? You think of favoritism, don't you? You think of God favoring a certain people and it's out of this idea of a master race or a chosen people that so many cruel things arise in the history of the human race, right? we are better than everyone else and therefore we have the right to rule and we have the right to destroy anyone who is not a part of that chosen race. And thus we see how our modern sensibilities are at once just repulsed by this whole idea of selectivity. But again, whether we like it or not, this is a general principle behind nature itself. Nature is, by its very nature, selective. Think about the universe in general, the entire cosmos. How much space that is empty compared to matter? Most of it is empty. There is very little matter versus overall empty space. And now take all of that matter and compare the amount of inorganic, non-living matter with organic matter. Again, so much compared to so little. And then think about life itself and how it's reproduced, how it takes millions upon millions of sperm to fertilize one egg, and only one makes it out of the millions and hundreds of millions that make the attempt. And then things that are alive, how many irrational, non-rational beings are there compared to what we know of, only one rational species? And then even among the rational species of the Earth and maybe other planets, how few and far between are the geniuses, the really smart ones compared to the average Joes and Janes? So nature itself, by its very process of development, is selective, and you might even say wasteful. You have all of this, and only a few are selected. Many are called, but few are chosen. So again, the incarnation crystallizes what is already in faint image and permeated throughout nature itself. But here's our big stumbling block. Isn't this cruel? If God is like what nature pictures God to be, then doesn't this bespeak the evil nature of God, the cruelty and meaningless suffering that God creates through this process of selectivity? And here's where we have to take a step back. Selectivity in and of itself is neither good nor bad, Lewis argues. It depends on 
how selectivity works. What you see as cruel and meaningless in nature, the incarnation sheds light on as something that could come and be derived from something that is good and therefore be a good thing. In our next segment, we will then talk about how selectivity in and of itself could be a sign not of cruelty, but of the highest love.